Whether your company is in growth mode, protecting what they have on hand, or adapting to a new normal, responsible expense management is never far from an executive's mind. This is particularly true during an economic downturn when the cash generated from expense reductions can be invested in growing your competitive advantage or as an alternative to more drastic action. My name is Philip Heidson and in this special five-part Art of Procurement series, I'll share with you the strategies and tactics that you can use to responsibly build the expense management program that your organization needs and achieve cost savings that stick. We'll consider how to build an expense management program, pitfalls to avoid, and the 24 different expense reduction tactics that you can use along the way. I'll be bringing my own personal experience from achieving hundreds of millions of dollars of savings as a practitioner and consultant over the last 20 years in a way that always focused on aligning outcomes with stakeholder and with company needs. Today, in part two of this five-part series, I share the major pitfalls to avoid to ensure that you deliver cost savings that stick. There can be a fine line between securing cost savings at stake and failing to meet your expense reduction goals. Yesterday, I shared about some of the steps you can take to build an expense management program. Before I go into the tactics that you can use today, I actually wanted to share the four most common mistakes that I see and have experienced, for better or worse, firsthand. We're going to spend most of the time on the first one, but then I have uh, some more as I go into the end of the show later. So the first one, the big one that I see um, happening so often, uh, and this is especially the case when you're looking at this from a, you have the burning platform um, and we're trying to figure out how we can quickly enable uh, an expense management program. And that is setting unrealistic cost savings targets. So here's how the conversation often goes, you know, between procurement and the CFO, the CEO. So the kind of thought process is, we spend a billion dollars per year, and that can be any number. It can be 100 million, it can be 50 million, it can be $10 billion. But let's just use this for argument's sake. Um, we use a bit, we spend, sorry, a billion dollars per year on products and services. We need to save $100 million. At 10% savings, that should be doable. Well, the harsh reality is that to achieve the $100 million in savings on a billion dollar spend, you may actually have to save 50% on every product or service that you renegotiate, that you have an expense reduction kind of project in place for, rather than the 10%. And suddenly that 100 million doesn't look as doable at that point as perhaps it did at face value. So why is this the case? You know, first of all, you've identified your billion dollars in external spend. Well, 80% of this spend is addressable. And, and when I share some numbers th as I go through today's pod, these numbers are, you know, a, a mixture of what we have seen through personal experience, you know, from consulting perspective, from being a practitioner perspective, and also some stats which are, you know, in the marketplace from a lot of the research firms. So your billion dollars in external spend, 80% of that is addressable. So what does that mean? Well, it means that... Um, expenditures that cannot be negotiated, such as taxes, pass-through expenses, intra-company transactions, investment costs, charitable donations, those are all deemed as unaddressable spend, you know, so that leaves your 80% of spend that's addressable. Because, you know, that number can vary wildly, honestly, from company to company, um, but it's usually not an insignificant number. So, for this example, we'll use 80% of the spend is addressable, 20% is unaddressable. So of that addressable spend, it's highly unlikely that you'll actually have real-time line of sight into all of it. So, you know, a lot of procurement teams use the metric spend under management to measure the percentage of spend that's influenced by procurement or that runs through a formal best practice process. A lot of procurement teams kind of calculate this differently. I've seen some procurement teams that look at it and say, hey, if it had a, an invoice in place, that's spend under management. That's not really what we're alluding to here really think about this as spend that you're able to see proactively and therefore influence it before it's spent versus reactively you know the first time you see it is actually in the invoice or in a spend analysis report spend on a management varies wildly by industry um, best in class organizations typically have over 90 percent spend on the management for most companies, that's closer to fifty, uh, closer to fifty percent to seventy percent as the range. 
Um, honestly, I've seen a lot of companies where it's you know twenty percent, thirty percent. There's organisations where procurement may have only really been able to um, build strong relationships in a single category. Um, so it's not unusual for that number to be a lot lower than that fifty to seventy percent range, but for the purpose of this calculation, we'll take 70%. So that $800 million in addressable spend now becomes $560 million in influenceable spend. Of our $560 million in influenceable spend, not every contract is available for renegotiation or for resourcing every year. Many contracts are multi-year. They often have minimum volume commitments. Now, there's some tactics you can use to renegotiate contracts before their expiration. Um, some of that is based on contract termination for convenience language, uh, market conditions in a particular category, the strength of your individual supplier relationships. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the tactics later in this series. But just thinking about the fact that, you know, you can't, you can't renegotiate 100% of your um, influenceable spend every single year. And honestly, the average that we see is um, usually between every two and every three years. When we're doing benchmarking, we typically use a two and a quarter year calculation to say this is what we think when we're looking at a a multi-year program is realistic for spend that we can influence in a given year. So at two and a quarter years, average length of a contract and average length of a deal that you can negotiate, then that reduces that $560 million of influenceable spend down to $250 million in any given year. The final consideration when setting a realistic savings goal is the idea of savings leakage or uh, rogue spend. It has a number of different kind of terms. But um, when you think of one of the primary areas of friction between procurement and finance, it's that the CFO doesn't necessarily see the reported or forecasted savings from procurement hit the bottom line. Now, reporting accuracy is one cause, but the primary reason is that the negotiated contracts are not fully utilized by the business. You know, you're you're using different volumes in your forecast for the savings that actually what occur in real life. Um, That can be one of the reasons, you know, those volumes. Um, And that's actually a pretty good thing because we always say, you know, you save 100% of the money that you don't spend. Um, But oftentimes that savings leakage, the rogue spend, is because the new deals don't actually align with the needs of the business or they haven't been communicated effectively. So buyers end up going rogue and sourcing products and services directly, you know, outside of those deals. Um, you know, if, if I had a penny for every time someone told me they could buy something cheaper from a local retailer, for example, without them seeing the back end rebates and benefits that we get, you know, the total cost, then I would be able to pursue my dream and buy my local professional football club. Um, We actually had a a podcast with Insight Sourcing Group CEO, Tom Beatty, who told me that he sees savings leakage of over 40%. Now, in our calculation here, let's be conservative and say 20%, you know, which assumes 80% savings compliance. But that means you need to target a savings goal that's 20% larger than the savings that you actually need. So let's pull this all together. You know, to save $100 million on your $1 billion spend in any given year, you might actually need to save that 50% on all of your savings project and not the 10% that you'd originally expected. Saving 10% because now we're looking at a $250 million spend with 20% savings leakage actually returns $20 million in savings rather than $100 million in savings. Now, how much influence we have in setting the savings target is debatable you know it ranges from organization to organization but these are some of the discussions that we need to be having um, as we are we want to make sure that we're not setting up an expense reduction program for failure Um, and oftentimes kind of these realities get missed so this is an exercise that we always walk through with executives who are actually setting those savings targets and the contribution of the savings targets from third-party suppliers Um, So again, there isn't necessarily um, an unrealistic expectation. So the second pitfall to avoid is determining arbitrary savings targets at the category level rather than taking into account market conditions. So you have your enterprise-wide savings target, you know, and this is then what I've seen. You look down a spreadsheet, somebody says, you know what, Um, 20% savings in logistics, 10% savings in marketing, 15% savings in legal, 
5% savings in facilities. Let's add those savings up based on our spend. There's my savings number. Here's what we need to go and achieve. That might be the quickest and the easiest way to set savings targets. But the result of that is you're going to enable this cost savings at all costs mindset. The, this might not be in the best interest of your company. You end up you know, going back to the needs assessment we talked about in the last podcast because you're chasing um, the cost savings without necessarily thinking about is this the right area, the right place to deliver those cost savings from. Now, I had one turnaround program that I had the opportunity to observe where the company compounded the first mistake, making unrealistic savings commitments, with the second mistake, which was then applying arbitrary targets based on these unrealistic expectations to categories without any consideration of the need or of market conditions. Needless to say, you know, the program fell badly short of targets, and it really led to a lot of long-lasting damage between procurement, stakeholders, finance, um, executives, and suppliers. Um, so I would just really encourage you to think about those two and how you're setting your goals in the first place. Let's go into um, three other kind of pitfalls that I see. The third one is um, sending a letter to all of suppliers with a demand for a certain percentage reduction or a cash rebate. You know, the letter goes something like this. Dear supplier, in these challenging times, let's come together to ensure positive outcomes so we can continue to buy from you in the future. With that in mind, we require a 10% cost reduction from all suppliers effective next Friday. Please respond that you agree to this reduction, and if you're not able, please anticipate a meeting with our chief procurement officer to discuss your reasoning. Thank you. Yeah, I've had the um, dubious honor of having to send some of those letters before. And it's sometimes seen as the easiest, quickest way to generate cash. Um, and I've been on the front line of supplier responses. And, you know, you may have a supplier or two who will be able to, who steps up and says, you know what, I'm going to do this. But that's the exception rather than the norm. Um, needless to say, if unless your company is in an existential crisis, so if you're a couple of weeks from bankruptcy, this just doesn't work very well. You know, it causes far more damage than good. And the reality is that in times when letters like this seem like a good idea, your supply base will actually have the same challenges. So really don't put them in that position unless it's your last resort. We really need to be looking at ways that so we can um, collaboratively work with suppliers to identify quick win opportunities. We're going to talk about some of those tactics later, but I just want to kind of bring this as a note of caution because I have seen um, organizations do this and I totally understand though sometimes when cash is going to run out in the next couple of weeks and we have to figure out a way to get some really quick cash in the door um, and so you try everything unless you're really in that situation you know please think twice before you really pursue a strategy that involves this tactic. The fourth action, and we've kind of talked about this before, you know, it's taking actions that don't have alignment and buy-in from key stakeholders. So it's really easy to operate in a silo, especially in times when expense reductions are an urgent necessity. But in doing so, key stakeholders may feel like you're reducing their ability to do their job at best, and they find ways to circumvent company policy and spend with non-approved suppliers. As we said before, you know, that's what happens at worst, which is one of those primary causes of savings leakage. Communication and change management, those two elements are sometimes overlooked, but those are a critical part of expense reduction. Um, an example, Vision Care Health Insurance Company, VSP Global. We've had VSP um, and their CPO, Greg Tennyson, on the show a couple of times before, and some of his team members. Um, they created a fiscal fitness program that really aligned their organization's culture to encourage employees to spend company money like it's their own. One of the first things I do with an organization when we're looking at expense reduction programs is actually to talk to marketing and talk to HR and kind of look at culture and how we can message what we try to do. So again, it brings everybody together. It uh, knocks down some of those roadblocks as opposed to just saying, hey, we're going to save this money. We're going to do it and kind of steamroll your way through. The last um, pitfall to avoid, and this is, it's an it's hard to remember this when you're in the heat of the battle of an expense reduction program, but that's losing sight of your medium to long-term goals. So as part of our Procurement Inc. framework here at Art of Procurement, we talk about breaking the hamster wheel of changing priorities. So 
those that are really a result from short-term decision-making where, you know, an organization has a burning platform to save costs. They pursue an aggressive focus on price reduction and on policy compliance. You achieve the savings, but then a trail of destroyed supplier and stakeholder relationships are left. Um, as business conditions improve, the focus changes to supplier relationship management and business partnering. It takes an awful long time, if you're ever able to actually do it, to regain the trust lost during the cost reduction phase. And as soon as you start to make progress, the focus shifts back to cost reduction and the value that you maybe deliberately left on the table gets swept up with one of these, oh, those are, that's some quick cash that we can go after. Each time you go through that cycle, it becomes even more difficult the next time to utilize your supply base as a growth driver. That's why it's really important to be communicative and transparent with all our stakeholders, internal and external, about your expense management program. And just think about the responsibility of some of the actions that you take. Um, it's just super important because you are going to need your suppliers and your stakeholders if you're a procurement um, function. You know, it's, it's easy for an organization to look at procurement, to bring procurement out of the box, so to say, to help with expense reduction. Um, that's a great opportunity for us to demonstrate the value that we can deliver that goes above and beyond saving money to change perceptions that we're actually able to bring value over the long term and lots of different value levers that we can help an organization pull. If we're going in with that cost reduction at all costs and we lose sight of those medium to long term goals, frankly, the organization will just put us back in the box as soon as that burning platform is over. So really important not to lose sight of those elements um, as we are going through kind of the process of helping our organization in the short term. So there's five pitfalls again. One is setting unrealistic cost savings targets. Two is determining arbitrary savings targets at the category level rather than taking into account market conditions. Third is sending a letter to all suppliers with a demand letter for savings based on a certain reduction or a cash rebate. Four is taking actions that do not have alignment and buy-in from key stakeholders. Five is losing sight of your medium to long-term goals. So that wraps up part two of this special series, Expense Management, Achieving Cost Savings That Stick. I'll be back tomorrow to start sharing specific tactics that you can use. Thanks for listening to this Art of Procurement special series. For more information and for templates and cheat sheets that you can use to help drive savings that stick, we've created a free to access expense management hub that is powered by AOP Mastermind. For more information about the expense management hub, go to artofprocurement.com expensehub. That's artofprocurement.com expensehub. expense hub.